So hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Good Valley Juju Podcast. I'm Min from Cloud of Victory, Dark Square, as you know, and I'm here um, with the very fabulous, fearless, flexible, flawless Harper Waters. Hi Harper. Hello, hello, hello. And hi to Roxy, your dog as well, who I'm sure is, I can see is keeping you company. (laughs) Yes, Roxy is here. She's my quarantine buddy and she's short on words, but if she wants to say something, I will let you know. She'll make her presence known. Very that. Um, so how have you been doing in um, quarantine in Houston? Like, how have you been doing personally and how have things been with the company? Personally, I have been up and down. I think that uh, at the start of quarantine, I it just felt like a vacation. It really felt like we were going on a little bit of a layoff that every mm-hmm. ballet company sometimes, you know, we do. And yep. it just felt like a break. And not knowing the severity of the disease and the impact that it was having uh, led me to kind of just chill. Mm -hmm. And the more I saw things and learned about things and um, just took in the information, I realized that we were in a very difficult and different situation and one that would be impacting us Mm -hmm. for for the foreseeable future. Um, as a company, we we took a we took a big hit. You know, like every other ballet company, yeah. things were ended, um, jobs were stopped, and it's like we, as an organization, had to collectively come together and decide how are we going to bring our mission of providing high class, world class dance to our audiences. Um, I had to do that personally. I had to do that. Uh, as part of the organization as well, um, which was creating content for at home, um, dancing on my kitchen, uh, you know, dancing around <laughs> on the sidewalk. And I had, to, I had to step into not only being a dancer, but, but, but being my own kind of artistic director mm-hmm. and wardrobe and musician. And it was, we were, we were tasked with putting on a lot of different hats to continue creating uh yeah so i guess i mean i say that all to say that it's been a creative roller coaster (laughs) of of emotions um but i'm i'm lucky to and happy and grateful to be in a position where i can continue to do that um and so you know when you talk about having to you know like you said like having this creative roller coaster, how are you managing to be creative during this time? Because, um, you know, we are not around other people to say brainstorm ideas off or just create with, you know, when you're creating mm-hmm. content by yourself, like it can, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's probably not as, and it can be more mature, not as enjoyable. So how are you finding ways to stay creative and has that been a challenge for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, it, I've, been able to do a lot of self-reflecting on in this time and one thing I discovered is that you know as a dancer when I step into the studio I'm often it's my I mean it's my job to take the steps and to create something Mm -hmm. and when a choreographer is in front of me and gives me the the moves or idea to try something I not only have to uh, execute that but I have to think about what I'm trying to say and with the steps and I tried to take that into the content and just my my thought process during quarantine is what am I trying to say and what am I and how am I going to say it now that I can't fully dance in the studio um, and just respond to what was going on in the world and that seemed like my the best and natural and most authentic response was to just to think about what am I trying to say and how am I going to respond and um, I was really interested in collaboration collaboration is something that interests me all the time and not just keeping it in the dance world and merging Mm. things with different genres and i had so many um i have so many people in my life who aren't dancers who i've worked with and i was like well what what are they trying to say as artists right now and can we come together collectively to do that um and overcome the hurdle of social distancing so i was I was motivated to to say something with collaboration in creating short films and short um, pieces of dance 
um, with those people all through social distancing. Um, so I did that personally, which was really rewarding. Um, and it was <laughs> difficult at times, but yeah, I think I just, as it, I, I was, it was one of the first things I realized in quarantine was how much dance dictates my life and every day it's oh, like yeah. what I wake up, for, you know, what I wake up for and, um, what role am I going to be doing in two weeks dictated what I ate or how I slept or, you know, how I would push myself in class. And when you take that away, you lose that sense of, of, of drive and motivation mm -hmm. and creating these little short works or creating a photo shoot in my backyard or, um, doing a dance in heels with a dress to Cardi B saying coronavirus, you know, that, that is, a project and I treated it as a little ballet mm. of, of, of putting it together. And, and that has been really therapeutic in, um, in, in during this time. Did you feel um, any pressure to put out more content? Um, you know, obviously as a content creator, mm -hmm. just feel like I gotta like get on that TikTok now. I gotta, you know, get on this Instagram content now. I gotta do all this stuff because I don't, I mean, um, it's either that I may not have this amount of time that I have now or because, you know, you see everybody else, like, you know, we're talking about hustling, everybody else are doing things. Did you feel that pressure of, like, I got to do that too? I got to keep up. Yeah, definitely. I, it wasn't less, it wasn't so much a pressure to put out a lot of content, but more just I felt pressure to put out correct content. I wanted to be, uh, I didn't want to, insult anybody. I didn't want to um, offend anybody and I wanted it to be of the moment. Mm. Um, and it's really difficult. Um, it's, I, I mean, I shouldn't say difficult. I just, it's one of the, one of the tasks of being a creator is mm. how, is, is how, is your content reactionary or are you, are you the one making the action? And mm. I didn't want my content to be so much of, um, so much of a do this, do that. I wanted it to be, this is how I'm feeling in this moment. And that gave me, um, that gave, that gave me reassurance that what I was putting out was okay. And it was honest. Um, I think that I the first stuff that I put out was humorous mm. and, um, com and comedy driven because I didn't think, and I didn't know the severity of everything. And I was like, Oh, this is going to pass. And then as it became more um, real, my, my content became more real. And mm. uh, so that's, that's, that's just how I personally do it. It's interesting. I think I, I walk a fine line of between influencer and artist, you know, first and foremost, I am a soloist with the Houston Ballet. So, and my social media is just a natural reaction of Mm. the fabulous version I've created of myself. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so everything, everything that I did was, was, I hope, um, was um, just authentic response to what was going on. Um, so when you say correct, um, yeah. sort of what do you mean by that? Like, like, you know, you touched on what you were worrying about. You know, was it like correct content in terms of wanting to strike the right tone in like the era of coronavirus? Is that what? Mm -hmm. is I think it's really that and this is something that I'm just, I'm very, I, I tend to have a, a lot of filter on me. I don't know if that is a dancer thing or if that's a, just a Harper thing, but I think I always try to be correct in my approach towards being inclusive and not offending people and um being you know my dad's in politics you know yeah. that maybe that maybe that's why but i didn't want to look and come across like i was not taking things seriously, seriously yeah yeah and it's interesting because when you put something out on social media that's what everybody is seeing yeah that image, that video but they're they're not always seeing you the other work that you don't share and so yeah. it's of course they're going to base their opinion off of of yeah. what they see that's that's social media and so i didn't want to paint the picture that i wasn't um caring or that i wasn't aware 
Um, and I know I said that I was, you know, the first things I posted was comedy and that's, and uh, I do, in, in talking to you now, three months later, I do think that self-care is part, is part of that, you know, like you need to find things that bring you joy. Yeah. And, uh, and that brought me joy. And so I own that in posting it, but I've, I was, I was worried at the time, you know, like, do, am I coming across as insensitive? Um, so I think that's what I mean by correct. I think it's really, I, it's really important. I just think to read the room and th the room was coronavirus, a serious medical uh, disease. And I wanted my, my response to be appropriate. Um, well, first thing I would say to that is that um, I don't think anything you posted about, about it was inappropriate as somebody who, you know, <laughs> oh, good. Was, but... has been dealing with coronavirus for, you know, since longer than the US and was kind of when it hit you guys, I was, really sick of it by then um yeah but i also do want to say um as some i can relate to what a lot um to what to a lot of what you said as a you know you know i run a business but it's the same thing where we are content creators and there's also a sense of i think both of us wanting to be responsible with our content which is kind of funny because when you think about it sometimes we we walk that line between seeming a little bit cheeky and a little bit irreverent but at the same time i think we're both yeah. very conscious about like our irreverence or our humor, I feel like doesn't come up from a place of wanting to be disrespectful. But I think it's also recognizing yeah. the fact that there is something very important about bringing humor and a bit of brevity to a situation and how that can, well, I feel like, say, when we, and I felt like this is what, you know, you achieved as so when you did that little dance about coronavirus is that, like, um, sometimes messages can be conveyed more, uh, how to put it? Sometimes messages can be conveyed more effectively if it's through something humorous or something what people can connect with. And also, I think it brings some amount of like comfort to people because even in like a very serious situation, you gotta be able to laugh at it. You gotta be able to find some humor in it while acknowledging how something is still very serious. Because, um, you know, Definitely. if not, then it's just it just really just drags you down. Yeah, and I, th I, I, I think that it would also be really obvious if all of a sudden I just started reading medical facts on my page, and it just wouldn't. I don't think that the audience that I have built, the 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 family of watchers and people, I don't think that their response to that would be the magnitude that it could have been if I did it truly to how I would want to do it. Yeah, um, and so I. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying and that the irreverence of it all, I think was, I, I definitely think was there. Yeah, um, it's actually something that is leading into something else who I want to talk to you about because, you know, you said you are quite careful with what you put out, but at the same time, you also come across as somebody who is very comfortable embracing, you know, who you are and the many facets of your identity and sort of um, being able to just show you know, who you are on your Instagram page. And I know it seems effortless, but it seldom is because, like you said, the point of Instagram is that when it, su it succeeds because it makes something that is effortful, like a piece of content you spend time creating, look effortless. And mm -hmm. that's when you succeed. So how, for you, how did you find that confidence to, you know, uh, I guess, put out who you are and talk about who you are and your identity, not just as, you know, you're a black male male dancer, you know, you can, you know, and that's something you've fully leaned into, which I think is fantastic, but also uh, not just that, but you're also an individual in terms of you are being half a water, so you are being you. Um, is that something yeah. that you had to learn how to, ex like, find that confidence to do, or is that something that you've always been comfortable with sharing and accepting that, you know, all the different facets of yourself? Well, I mean, the short answer would be that I just found that when I accepted who I was and shared that authentically, my dancing got better. Right. And so, and it was, it, I mean, it, that's the short answer. The reality is that I'm still learning to do that. And mm. I joined the company in 2011, it's 2020, and I'm still learning to find my voice. But the process... I've, 
I really found a lot of parallels between social media, my social media and my dancing. Right. And the response of people, resp- the, the overwhelming response to me running on a treadmill in pink heels or <laughs> me kick splitting with all my friends all over, you know, like the dance studio, what that reaction, that was more me. And I was like, okay, well, how do I th- then translate that into my dancing, right? Yeah. I'm not gonna run out on stage and do prints and pink heels. That's maybe in a few years, but <laughs> I'm a <laughs> but, version of that cracker. <laughs> sorry that, yeah. But like, it's just it's learning. It, it it's it was learning how to bring more elements of who I was, and mm-hmm. a, there's so much that plays into that. In in you see the dancers at the top, you want to try and emulate that. I didn't see dancers of color who were queer at the top, so. As a young dancer, I thought, okay, well, I have to turn the volume down on these certain qualities and try to be something um, that I saw at the top. Not taking away from their talents, I just thought that that's what I had to do. But you had to fit Uh, the mold. I had to fit the mold. And um, one really uh, kind of experience that really stands out in my career was in 2015, I... Uh, Stanton, our director at Houston Ballet, he chose me to represent the company for the Princess Grace Awards. And part of the audition or, uh, you know, like submission process is you have to film a solo in one take um, and not necessarily live, but you just have to, you have to film it in one go. And so I would rehearse it with him and um, I fell out of a turn in rehearsing it with him. It was a solo by him. And I stopped and he kind of looked at me and stopped the music. And I was like, oh, here we go. He's going to be like, what happened with that turn? Why, like, why'd you stop? Like, why'd you stop? And I was ready to kind of just like give an explanation. But he said, he looked at me and he said, Harper, you're never going to get the perfect wave. It's about riding the wave you're given. And I really took that as the pirouette means nothing unless you're trying to say something. Mm. And I had no idea what I was trying to say. If anything, the only thing I knew what I was trying to say is I want to be someone else. And right. the second I, I started saying, no, I'm, I'm fabulous. I'm flamboyant. I'm sassy. I have humor. I can play with the musicality this way. I can use my focus this way. I can hold that step out longer to really give more focus or, you know, a palma on this angle, then I'm, then that's Harper. And when I started to do that, my dancing got better and my opportunities increased. Mm. And in 2016, I was promoted to Demi Soloist. In 2017, I was promoted to Soloist. And I really attribute that to me getting the confidence and understanding of how to share myself and, and put myself out there. It's not, it's not easy to do, I will tell you. You know, I, oh, yeah. I still... T- you know, I still to this day get uncomfortable um, doing solos or what are they going to say? But in, in, in my frame of mind is also, you are the person that they're watching in that solo. You are the soloist right now. Mm. You, are, you have your opportunity. Now, what are you going to say? Mm. And um, with my social media, like we, I was saying, you know, like, what am I trying to say with things, whether it is in response to COVID, whether, whether it is right now with Black Lives Matter, yeah. um, you know, what am I trying to say? And when I think about what am I trying to say as Harper, not as anybody else, but as Harper, the, that's when the content and the, the dancing is the best. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it, that's how I, in, a, in a short, <laughs> not um, so short. Does it ever feel... I guess the word is lonely. Does it ever feel lonely because of the fact that you, like I said, you know, you, you are one of the dancers who really embrace social media and at the same time embracing social media in a way where you don't, like you said, don't pretend to try and fit into anybody else's mold. And because mm-hmm. you are, you know, like you may not see other people around you who are doing the same things, which I think is a good thing because... I think, I mean, just from a standpoint of saying, if we're talking about being a content creator, being unique, it's a great thing. Mm-hmm. Being a dancer, being unique is a great thing too, as an individual and embracing that. But does it ever feel lonely? Because you may not have other people around you who 
care who you just be like even though there are other people around you they're not they're not putting themselves out there as much and so maybe that's not something you can relate to that's not something that you can be like oh you know that person's done that too so i feel a bit more reassured that i'm not the only one standing mm-hmm. you know, on the island trying to shout at everybody like that this is okay and this is who i am and it's okay to be who you are yeah i would say you know in in finding my voice i'm i'm and developing who Harper is, I've just learned that just like in ballet, when they say quality over quantity, you know, the quality of your friends and the quality of people you surround yourself with is so much more important than the quantity. So I have this amazing, I'm lucky to have so much support in Houston and I don't feel lonely, but you know, the quality is surround yourself by people who uplift you and believe in you and cheer your graces. Um, And when you surround yourself and create the environment um, that supports you and where you can feel like you can make mistakes and be vulnerable, I, I assure you that the, you will not feel lonely, one, but your work will become so much, just have so much more value. Mm. Um, and I can see it not just as, you know, a Black queer dancer. When I step out, I feel supported. You can see it in the work of a dancer who is owning who they are because what they're putting out on stage is just so honest. I mean, you have to think about the performances of Juliet and the or the p- performances of Swan Lake. When you're seeing them as people, that comes from a place of they are able to share themselves and 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 get lost in the role, and and that's their path of self discovery that you know I I'm on as well. I think mine is definitely um, a little bit more unique or rare when it comes to the ballet world, because I am a person of color. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily feel lonely, but um, I definitely do feel supported. That's good. Um, and, you know, we've sort of been acquainted via the magic of Instagram for a few years now. Um, and following you, I've also noticed that, you know, and this is something you mentioned earlier over time, you've also started to use your platform, not just to create, the fun, amazing content of like you dancing with you or doing all these, you know, more fun things which are amazing, but that you're also using your platform to speak up against, speak up for things or against things that are important to you. You know, you speak up against like toxic masculinity, you speak up for LGBTQ rights, voting rights, against systematic discrimination, and of course, um, things like Black Lives Matter, which um, is important. Um, was this a conscious decision that you made to sort of speak up more because um, I think we've had like a private DM about this a little bit where I was saying that it's almost easier for us as like in individuals and businesses as brands to be more uh, careful with what we say and to be less overt with how we say things because when you speak up and you take a stand for things, you know, you're making yourself more vulnerable and you're opening yourself up to criticism because there will be people who disagree with you. And so it's easier to just play it safe and just be very safe about things as opposed to saying, no, I have um, a responsibility because I have a platform and I want to use it in a way that yeah. I think is meaningful. So for you, yeah. was it a conscious decision to speak up? And how do you decide how and when to say something? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, yes, it was a conscious decision. Just like in dance, when I kind of discovered that my dancing got better when I was more honest. Mm. I am older now. Things apply to me more. You know, I have a deeper understanding of politics and my rights mm. or lack thereof my human rights as a gay person. And when you feel the weight and impact of that on you, and know that you have and that or that I have a say in in affecting change yeah. um, it felt like the right thing to do to use the audience that I have to share information and um, when I was fifteen years old in h b two I didn't have the the voice or knowledge nowhere near I have now to say anything. Um, but what I, what I was doing was I was so aware of the people who I was just obsessed with and I followed and loved to see do things. 
And whether it was YouTube or, you know, uh, Instagram wasn't a thing then, but like, I just wanted to follow them. And I have to remind myself that there are people who are watching and especially dancers, you know, it's like we're this little bubble of a world, but we can affect so much change with the art that we create and um, changing the face of what ballet is that it just, it, it felt so right not just for me, but for, for the people who follow me as well. So it was 100% conscious to start using my platform. Was I scared to do it? One million percent, I you know? It's, like, <laughs> it's so scary. It and is, right? It's very scary. And, but you have to trust in what you believe in. It's like, you have to trust your dancing. You have to trust your technique. You have to trust your choices and own who you are and I and I believe that that's the same type of trust you have when you um when you want to speak on on what you believe in and um it started with a repost to my story and that was it you know like oh. I put this like a news article and I was like oh my gosh I'm getting so political and then <laughs> it's like, well, you know what, what was the article about Oh, I, it must have been like years ago, about not years ago, but like a few years ago. Right, I, right. I want to say it must, it might have been about um, the re-election. Right. Uh, um, you know, and it just, the power to vote. I think mm. it fell in a time where I was, where it was my first time to vote. And I had mm. seen activists unrelated to ballet start sharing things. And um, I'm really grateful and fortunate to have, you know, carved a path for myself that is outside ballet, that is surrounded by different types of art makers and different types of creatives um, who have no knowledge of the ballet world, <laughs> but are um, equally as devoted to creating change and um, in their own sectors and in their own genres. And seeing their ability to use their voice inspired me to do it um, for my audience. And um, you know, it start, like I said, I started with a repost, maybe two reposts. Maybe I then go to the Instagram feed and do a, like an in-feed post, but I just use a quote. You know, it's not my words yet. <laughs> yeah, because the then, thing is, like, it's scary when it's on the feed, right? Because it's more permanent. You're like, yeah. that's explicitly taking a step. Yeah, uh, so, but I swear, I've seen it now with my friends in the company and how they're responding to... Um, you know, this uprising right now in the Black Lives Matter movement is that the more they learn and the more knowledge they have on things, the more confident they are in sharing, the more confident they are in having conversations. And you, you, you start to see the uncertainty dissipate and the confidence increase. And I'm having, I'm hearing my friends talk about things so confidently that I never experienced before you know I used to be the one who was like this is wrong or like this is right and here I'm now having my friends who have never really participated in political conversation participate and they were nervous to share as well like I was um but now I'm it's so fun <laughs> to see their feed and their story and I'm like yes continue to share continue to post you have people watching you as well and you are making a difference and no act of information shared is goes unnoticed and isn't important because yeah it's just new eyes on new ideas and i i fully believe that with everything i do visibility is currency and not necessarily a monetary currency but who do you want to watch and why do you want them to watch is really important and once you have their eyes, what are you trying to say? Um, and I, I use that mentality and I'm, I'm so proud of the work that um, I've seen my company and other companies do right now in response to, to everything our world is, is throwing at us. Um, and I think, you know, even though we talk about ballet being, you know, wanting to create inclusive, uh, wanting to be inclusive, there's also that sense of like, um, I know when I post some things that are a bit more safe for they go on the sea of the Instagram as well, it's that thing where it's like, you said it's very scary to be vulnerable and put yourself out there, but then it's also that thing, not just about being responsible and using a platform, but also saying maybe I can help to 
make people rethink about certain things, but it's also the sense of like, what kind of audience do we want to be um, attracting? Do we want people who are not receptive to certain ideas? And I'm not saying that people have to agree with us, but it's the whole thing. Yeah. Of like, do we want people who are just not receptive to listening to what other people have to say at all? Yeah, I, I definitely think that when, when, I, when I post something that could be controversial, let's say, or political or rooted in, um, in opinion, I try to, to just put it out there and say, think about it. Yeah. You know, this, this is a thought. And, you know, I, I don't say that you are wrong yeah. for your opinion, but here is my opinion. Yeah, and this, this is what this, I believe in. And this is what I feel this is what I believe in. And, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it's in just hearing myself talk about it. I find it interesting that I say that it's, it, it's, um, that I, it's like, I'm nervous to do it, but it's also, I've created, I've created that nervous system almost because, you know, there are people who use social media to post their food and to connect with friends and they don't have, they, they haven't curated this mass audience. They don't use social media as an entertainment tool. I just happen to be someone who loves Beyonce. I love Wendy Williams. I love pop culture and I play into that. You know, I play into those avenues of mainstream media, which has resulted in a popularized account for me. And so it's almost like I have created the pressure system for because myself. You have, you have more to lose almost, it feels like, right? Uh, yeah. You know, and, but I, I don't take it lightly and I, I accept the position that I'm in and I'm grateful to be in that, in that position. Um, like other dancers, you know, who have put themselves in that position. Uh, but it's also important to remind whoever's listening that, you know, just because you have an audience does not make them a speaker on things or, um, you know, the spokesperson for that topic. Um, but uh, I, I enjoy and I am appreciative to take on the role that has that I I feel like I'm stepping into, and um, because I feel like it's the right thing to do, and I want to do it, and um, yeah, so. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I think as well. Um, I mean, I'm just speaking, say, from like personally, like my parents are not politicians, so whenever I post something that's a little bit less just focus on say CMV product or humor you know my advice that I get from the people around me is you know your business don't post these things you know mm -hmm. don't you know just 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 don't put yourself in that position to like, like stay in the middle. Yeah. yeah stay in the middle but then the other thing I sort of realized is that also that you know whether you're a you're an individual or your business or your brand is that people especially in the age of social media people want to see the human connection they want to mm -hmm. understand who you are and they want reasons to support you and to root for you. And part of that is, like you said, being vulnerable, whether it's speaking about issues or showing, like in areas of that, so showing the process of why you train or as a business showing how it works behind the scenes and, you know, the things you believe in because these are the things that help people understand a little bit about who you are and see you as mm -hmm. a human and as a person as opposed to just seeing say, you with like a crazy arabesque or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to put so much value into Instagram and social media because, you know, our real world is what is hurting right now. But, yeah. um, you know, there are 370 million people who use Instagram. That That's how many followers the Instagram account has. So if you think that, you know, by sharing yourself authentically or honestly, you're not going to have people there are so many people out there who are waiting to see the content that they resonate with and they respond to i i'm like it might take longer but the people are out there for you to build a community for and it's just i will tell people that success is so much sweeter when you do it <laughs> staying true to who you are yeah. and it, you know and um when i get the responses of thank you or you know the, there's boys in heels or there's boys stepping into a into a dance studio i don't look that look at that as 
um, th them putting on the heel. And I'm like, yes, I'm, I look at that as confidence. And yeah. I look at that as, as my community. And we are helping each other to, you know, push, push the boundaries and push the limits. And um, that's, what, that's what really excites me. Um, yeah, I think you, you did raise an important thing that we all have to be aware of that social media, you know, as much as it's given us both lots of opportunities to connect and to, you know, build up uh, and like to find opportunities, like whether it's financial or otherwise, it's, you know, first of all, not the end all and be all of everything. Yeah. Because like you said, there is a whole life outside of it and it's something we should be careful not to get caught up in overly and put all of our work into that. But at the same no. time, like you said, it's an incredible way to reach out to people. Like you said, you have boys sharing videos of themselves dancing with heels and telling you thank you. And I remember um, once I got a message from a girl who said, um, who was like wearing my CMV coding and she was like, I was inspired to start recovering from an eating disorder because of you. So there is like, there is this is power in it. Yeah. Like, social media 100%. yes and you are yeah you you are building a community of mm. based off of you know your principles and your morals and i can imagine that you know there are so many people who have had the idea of starting a business or starting a company or building on an idea that they're looking at themselves and thinking i could never do that yeah. and the thing look at it, you can you can you can create such beautiful dancewear and um, a love for Roberta Bole. <laughs> always, always. That is that's a dream collaboration. I have yet to meet him yet. So me too. I'm like, I've been close. I've been in the same building as him. Same building. Six degrees of separation. Now we have to say six feet apart. But you yeah, know. six feet apart. <laughs> but I'm sure it will happen. You know, once this, once the apocalypse is over. We will both meet Roberta. Uh, we'll, we'll go together. Okay. You yeah. can go first. <laughs> <laughs> you know all I want to do? Really? People are like, what are you going to do? And you meet him. I'm like, I just want to touch his abs to see if they're real. Maybe break some cheese, break them on to see if it works. Great, great, great. And yeah. then I'm done. I'm good. And then you sashay away. Yeah. I've, 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 touched, I've touched godliness. I'm, I'm good now. I've touched perfection. <laughs> good now. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think it's the thing of like, you know, like you said, social media is not the end of the all, but it is a medium to connect with people and build a community. Um, yes, I, I fully believe it's something, it's how you use it. Yeah, it's how I you will, use it. I will defend it. I, I see the negative sides, but I also am a product of the positive sides. And I have been able to connect and reach so many people that I never, ever would have had the opportunity to do. And the projects and collaborations and has given me the confidence to be the dancer and person I am today. So I fully believe it's how you use it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's, well, I mean, I hope what we're doing, um, pe like people like you and what I hope we're doing is trying to like drown out the negative side of social media by like using it in a way that, you know, hopefully is more positive. And I think part of that is reminding people again, that it's not the end all and be all everything. It's just a tool. Yeah. And it's how you use it. Um, but, you know, speaking of that, that's two things I want to ask, which is, I mean, how do you deal with criticism and, you know, trolls? Because like you said, the thing about speaking up and being vulnerable is that you will get people who dissent and some people dissent in a very polite way. And some people, again, you know, this is the problem with the internet where you're, people will say things to you that they wouldn't otherwise have to say to you face to face. Because yeah. It's just easier to write it on a keyboard. How do you deal with that? And does that, is that something that affects you personally to read comments like that? Mm -hmm. uh, it affects me, but I'm also someone who's very strong-willed. And um, I, a lot of you know, my friends will tell you that I'm very quick-witted and I love to be shady and read people. So <laughs> I... <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> you know, I so that. I... I hate name calling mm. and I hate making fun of people, mm. but I do think that if you can insightfully uh, respond, why not? And if you can't, then delete and block and keep it moving. Mm. Um, 
it's their problem, it's not yours. And, um, but also I, you know, it, you're being disruptive, it, 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 that creates change. You know, when people are uncomfortable, they show it in, in, in different ways. And I don't, I believe that you can't, you can't have change without people becoming uncomfortable or disruptive. So sometimes, you know, I'm not looking for people, the trolls to comment. So I'm like, yes, I'm doing something right. But I feel like I'm disrupting and I am, they saw my, they saw my post. They saw me today. And what did that do? What did that change in their mind? Um, and that's, that's, that's sort of how I look at it. Um, but I, I'm hesitant to engage. I do find it entertaining sometimes too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, in reality, you really, you really shouldn't because it's just, it's so poisonous. And um, it is one of the downsides of, of social media, this opportunity to just freely critique. Um, on, and it's just, it's, it's unnecessary. But if I, you know, everything I do is for inclusivity, diversity, and to empower by example. And if I want equality, I'm not going to get that by shutting people out. I'm just mm. not. Yeah. So I, I, I try to approach my interactions with everybody with that mentality. Um, and so, you know, responding in, with hate or, or aggression, I'm not going to, I never would do that. Um, but the harsh reality is that there will always be people who, who don't agree. agree with you. Yeah. Um, so just let them don't agree um, and keep them on the side. <laughs> like you said, move along. Because yeah. Yeah, I do notice that when you have responded, you usually do tend to respond constructively and you leave very thoughtful comments, which are firm as to what you believe in, but they're not, like you said, hateful. And I think um, that's very important because and this is something that's easier said than done, but it's that whole thing where you're not going to get people to see where you're coming from if all you're going to do is to shout at them because the response for them is no. to shout back. And I know it's yeah. easier said than done because um, I, my parents and I don't always have the same opinions about things politically, and so there's been a lot of shouting across yeah. each other as opposed to having discussion. But I think that's something yeah. that's really important to sort of keep in mind. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I 100% agree. 100% agree. Um, but then the other thing I do want to ask you is, um, because, and I think I do want to ask you this because like you said, your dad is a politician, so he's doing a great job at what he is doing, is how then do we surround ourselves with people who support us, but also be very aware not to just be in an echo chamber? Um, because it's very easy, on the other hand, to just only have people who agree with you. Yes. Yeah. It's, I guess it's almost easy in a way. So how do we yeah. make sure that we, yeah, we're just not just listening to people who are from us as opposed to people who maybe make us think and challenge our opinions a little bit? Yeah. I would say that first, the first step of that is to almost do build an echo chamber. Be aware of who is around you when you feel good. Who is around you when you are laughing, belly laughing? You know, who is around you where you are unaware of what, you know, you're not thinking about, am I, am I, am I, am I being watched? Am I being looked at? Yeah. You know, to be aware of, of where you are and, who, and who's around you when you feel your best is very, very important because self-care and self-confidence is vital in even having the guts to go out and confront people who maybe mm. don't agree with you. So I would say the first thing to do is build this sort of echo chamber of, okay, I have this security blanket of people who are listening to me, agree with me. Now, how do we create change? And I'm having to reflect on that right now. And I don't know if, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, addressing racism in ballet, and confronting people who have different ideas than me um, and an understanding of the situations, how do you confront that? And it's really, I'm finding that 
I'm finding that trying to find commonalities or things that we have in common, how can we, I relate to you? What do we have in common to say that we are on the same playing field? Now let's discuss things. And just being open to, you know, to change and being open to listening, I think is really, really powerful right now. I've, I've been hearing so many honest stories. I've been speaking with the ballet right now and upper management, and I've just joined the board on, at Walnut Hill School, for, which is my old high school, yeah. um, in, um, in confronting these issues. And uh, I've just seen so, the, the biggest moments of change happen from pure honesty and people really telling their stories. Um, and it's like these people who have different opinions maybe, they're like the trolls <laughs> on Instagram, you know, and you have to like how you either have to say, are we going to have a real conversation? And if not, then keep it moving because in, in, unless two people or three people are all willing to take their guard down and, ha and be open, then it's nothing's, nothing's going to come from that. So, um, it's a learning process. I'm still learning. I don't know how, I don't have a direct answer in. No, I think it's tricky. It's tricky. And how to, and how to say change, you know, my dad, it, him being a, a, a senator and going into the house um, floor and, and speaking, I just think it comes from an extreme confidence in what he believes in and having unwavering, um, dedication and diligence in that and finding you know our biggest call to action i believe as an activist is to continue learning mm, yeah. and to continue to push yourself and to learn and never get complacent the more you know knowledge is power so i just find he continues to learn he continues to put himself into uncomfortable situations and that motivates him and pushes him to step down into speaking in front of conservative voices and opinions all the time and he doesn't stop and that's what's inspiring to me um to push myself to always learn so that i always have something to say um and i think um when you know there has to be a certain amount of humility that we have to have yes um because if not we're not going to be able to learn because if we assume that everything we believe is right 100 percent and we're not willing to read up more and enrich ourselves and acknowledge that when, that things that we have done before, even if we don't realize it, have been wrong or have behaviors that need to be changed, then we're never going to, you know, be able to, how do I put this, be effective in the work that we want to do and the things that we want to say. Yeah. I mean, I have, ex I'm an only child. I have extreme only child syndrome where I <laughs> where I think I am always right. I think the world revolves around me. And <laughs> Are you sure it doesn't? I, really I don't. Sure. I mean, it might. It might. It might. But, it might. Yeah, it might. But, you know, I, I'm i learning and just in, in joining a new family or having a chosen family at the ballet. Yeah. It's, I find that when it's something affects me, like when it's my problem, I'm like, everybody drop everything. Listen to me. <laughs> this is a big deal. And then when it's someone else, I really struck. I'm like, get over it. I'm like, it's not a big deal. Like, but I'm I'm trying to work on my listening, on my on my empathy. Empathy right now is so important, and yeah. um, tuning into how we can be more empathetic and to be to listen more to people's stories uh, is really beneficial. And yeah, I, I just say that to say that it's, I responded to what you were saying about, you know, accepting when you are, are wrong and, and, and owning that is really important as well um, and addressing how your actions affect others. Um, so, but. I mean, it's tricky. Nobody wants to be wrong. I don't like being wrong, you know? Yeah, everyone, everyone doesn't like to admit that and that's a, that's a difficult part. Um, and I think this might be, putting you a bit on the spot, but I just want to ask your opinion about it, is that um, because so many dancers, you know, you're in a system where, say, when you see something maybe in ballet in your company that you don't agree with, I mean, speaking up about it can affect people, it can affect their career, it can affect their livelihood. So 
but the fact of the matter is that there are some still some things in ballet which should are not acceptable and you know but still go on like if we're just talking about say black lives matter blackface still happens in ballets they happen in ballets um you know that were staged recently um mm -hmm. as an asian person yellow face still happens it mm -hmm. happens at a lot in nutcrackers across america still it makes mm -hmm. me upset to see but at the yeah. same time when you're a dancer and you're dancing in a ballet you may not feel that you can speak up about it first and then it, it, without jeopardizing your career and second whether or not that will actually make any change so for you um what do you think is your personal approach to dealing with you know these sort of um uh, in you know things about ballet that need to be changed yeah uh what i would say is right now i think uh, well in america these companies are awake they have woken up to it and I am confident that when we all return to the stage, that the changes will be seen. Um, you know, I, one of my uh, colleagues, she's, her name is Kirsten Fentoy. She's a soloist at Boston Ballet. And she wrote an article for Point Magazine that I thought was so profound. And I think that um, anyone listening should go read it. And she spoke about well-intended ignorance and um, how, you know, why is it that d black dancers are told to go to Alvin Ailey Dance Theater of Harlem, yeah. Houston Ballet? It's because all those companies have a long history of African-American dancers. It doesn't mean that they couldn't go and dance in other places, but they're, the intention of the faculty who are guiding them it's well intended. You will do well there. You're black. Yeah. But that's ignorant, yeah. you know, and put more pancake on. You need to be whiter. You need to blend in for Swan Lake or Giselle, you know, they're in their brain. It's just the ballet. They're not even seeing it as a race thing, Yeah. but it's ignorant. Yeah. And these are the conversations that need to be happening and are starting to happen. And I think that in America, you know, it, in Russia, when you see the blackface, it, that I, I cringe, but it's so anti, it's so antiquated, and it's over there that I'd hope that if we start to ballet companies have a in America have a real are in a real pivot moment right now where they can make changes that would affect ballet companies everywhere. Yeah, you know, in how dancers want to where dancers want to dance and you know, what they deem acceptable and what audience members should want to go see. And I think that these companies now are awake and will start making those changes that, and will start identifying when the yellow face is wrong. You know, when the, let the girl wear brown tights, let her wear brown point shoes, yeah. you know, let their natural hair be out and realizing that, that is ignorant, that is racist, and you can change it very simply. Um, so I guess that, I mean, I don't know, I, I'd say read the article and I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but um, people are awake now and they put messaging out that says, look, we identify this. You saw all the black squares go over social media. You saw the statements from every ballet company. Yeah. Okay, well now you can't let us down. And, um, you know, I know I'm rambling, but no, with, so with, with social media, cancel culture is a, is a big, is a big thing. And it's quite toxic when someone makes I one think. mistake, you know, when someone makes one mistake, all of a sudden their career is over. Yeah. If they if, if they misstep once, Every, yeah. anything they've done before um, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But I think that in a fear of cancel culture, in a fear to be canceled, there is this new tight filtration system that companies are now looking at through a lens that they never were looking at before. And it's like this silver lining to cancel culture is that 
brands, companies, dance companies, in an effort to not be canceled, they are looking at their behavior. Mm. And that is what this fear has instilled. Do I think it's uh, appropriate on all levels? No, I think cancel culture is horrible. But do I I appreciate, I appreciate, and I think it's necessary for companies to now say, is this wrong? Will this be wrong? What will the response be if I do that? And that is change that needs to happen. Yeah, and um, I think what, I mean, just speaking as a perspective of an audience member, then, you know, our responsibility then is to not, like you said, not cancel people, because I agree with you, I think it's very toxic, but there's a difference between cancelling um, a company or a business or an individual and holding them accountable. And yeah. I think that's this distinction we have to make. And, you know, it's the situation where, you know, you remind them of what the change they're committed to but be re- and be receptive to hear what they have to say and to give them time to do it. But also, if they relate on it and if it's just hollow promises and empty words, you know, that's when you are firm with your... And it's weird, it's weird to say this as a business, but that is true that that's where you walk away with your money. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, my my dad going back to him as a politician, he always tells me effective change starts locally and then you reach national and then you reach international. And it's very easy to scream, take away all these things that are racist. But if I believe that if these companies do it, if if I do it, if I take it to my company where I'm from, you know, let Houston Ballet be the leader in this or push San Francisco Ballet to do this or Boston Ballet or wherever. If these dancers who are passionate about it, I see it, you know, I'm on Zoom meetings with dancers of color now um, where we're talking about these issues and airing out our, you know, our experiences. And then we go back to our company and we create this change. If you start where it is closest to you, I am certain and I'm confident that that will create the magnitude magnitude of change that needs to happen um, across the ballet world. You know, we have to change the infrastructure of this yeah. system that what ballet is built on. And yeah. it's, it's, yeah, we are, we're a part of history right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are a part of history. And it's what is so bizarre is that it's happening over zoom. We're <laughs> in a pandemic, you know, I can't see these people in um, a meeting. On social, it's happening on social media. It's happening on WhatsApp conversations and Zoom meetings, yeah. FaceTime. But yeah, that that is that is a manifestation of what how severe this issue is and the impact that it has. Is that what people are willing to do all this work like this because it needs to happen? And um, I do want to say something about that, which is that, um, and again, it's because you know, like you said, people don't realize how much work is done behind the scenes. Is that yeah. I also feel like people should also recognize that change takes time, yes. um, especially in big institutions. And we should absolutely hold, like as a business, I am trying to hold myself accountable and reflect. But, and, but I also recognize that in a bigger business, um, it, it takes longer because there's so many more moving pieces, but it doesn't mean that people are not doing the work. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, it's about holding people accountable, but also having to remember to be a bit patient. And yeah. giving people, and you know, seeing what people do, and if that change doesn't manifest, that's when. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this like a performance. You know, I'm looking at that. This is my rehearsal. I have to put in the work. Mm-hmm. I can't just step out on stage and execute this perfectly. I have to rehearse, 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 and sometimes it's going to be good. Sometimes it's going to be bad, but it's part of the process. And I wish that I could just do a triple double tour into a five pirouettes and do a switch leap and land in a tilt. But I, I don't, I have to work. I don't it. believe you. Do no. it. <laughs> I'm I definitely can't now, but, um, you know, it's not dance isn't something that you, you have the, um, the, the equation for you can't type it in and press enter and, your legs at 180 and um this that's just that's what this is as well you know it's gonna it's it's such hard work but it's such important necessary work and it's it's like 
the more necessary important it is the harder and longer it will take yeah and um i think it's easier it's always easy to be the one calling someone out it's easier to be the one who's self-righteous and just dashing off a couple of phrases in the comments than it is to be the people who are saying okay how are we going to make this happen yeah definitely um but um what are some changes that you would like to see happen in the ballet world um i mean i'm sure there's I, a long list <laughs> you know, yeah i you think know, that you know. i i'm in speaking with my high school and in the work that we're starting to do at houston ballet i think that I'll, I mean, I'll start by saying ballet is a such a unique art form and it is required to have such high level of skill. And yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to just get a role because to fill the a quota, you know, yeah. I want my skin to be the reason I get a role. I want my talent to do that. So how do we do that? How do we increase our chances for for people of color, for people of different genders, for sexuality, sexual orientation, ethnicities, race. How do we get, how do we do that? Mm. And, but it's also, how do we give, get them the confidence? Mm. How do they know that it's even a possibility? Mm. Um, and so the biggest change I think I would want is whether it's a mentor program or for more schools to be brought into our organization, to see our rehearsals, for speaking opportunities, to come to performances, just to increase the chances of, and let them know that it's a possibility. Um, you know, that whole um, royal family ballet drama with the prince. Right. You know, it's, that's a reality for everybody and young boys and young girls. And mm. just, it's like the umbrella of the dance world. You know, dance is weak or dance is feminine or you can't, you can't make a career in dance. Yeah. Yes, you can. And so, you know, my work and the biggest change that I would want, um, I think to affect long-term change would be to uh, what programs and what uh, opportunities can we do to bring the youth into, into our world. I think that I, you know, on paper, stop, black face stop yellow face yeah let people wear their flesh tone tights but those are those are immediate things i think that you i don't i would be hard pressed to believe that a company now would say that to or allow that to continue to happen in the next one of their productions mm. i just think it, I, I you would be ridiculous to do that now yeah um but how do we get the next Black Albrecht, the next Asian Odette, you know, how do we, how do we do that? And um, it starts with the, with letting people know that they can do it. And I think the other challenge is, isn't it, it's creating meaningful and lasting change. You know, yes. like you said, the immediate things that need to be changed are really good and they should be changed, but then it's how do we keep it going so that it's sustainable. Yeah. Um, I just have two questions left for you, which is one, oh. Um, how do you stay grounded as somebody who is very insta famous? <laughs> is insta famous, but you are insta famous. I see that what is it that Abercrombie ad and everything, but at the same time, you know, you're not, you know, uh, you're never somebody who sees like you're too in important for something or you, you know. So how do you, in that sense, stay grounded um, and stay yourself? Um, you know, I. I, I wish I had a, a brilliant answer. I think um, it's a really humbling thing to um, step into a room of so many people, um, like a ballet company, and to start your class and everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, yes, of course, there is a hierarchy and there is ranks, so that plays a part into it. But you know, when there is a new premiere or a world premiere, we are all on the same playing field. I am a dancer standing, you know, like for the same opportunity as 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 Chun Wei next to me or as Oliver on the other side to me. And I take that mentality with me um, everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. You know, my dance training has translated into if I do go to a shoot with Abercrombie, I want to be on time. Mm-hmm. I want to perform my best. I want to be respectful of who's the team of people. You know, I want to be respectful to the dressers who are backstage. Yeah. So it's it's prepared me. Um, that's that's who I am. Dance is, I'm a dancer. And so I take that with me into every element that I'm now kind of dipping my toe into. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I hope that that keeps me grounded. And I never, ever want someone to meet me in person and say, oh, I thought you were going to be different. You know, I want them to, you know, I want them to be like, oh, that, that is Harper. I, you know, you're, when it comes down to it, we're all people. Like, I mean, I would freak, I would freak out if Beyonce walked up to me. Well, Beyonce you know, we're is not, not people. Oh, she, yeah, she Beyonce is. Beyonce is not people otherworldly yeah. but um yeah I think it's I really would say that it's my dance training that keeps me grounded mm. um and realizing that we're all in the same playing field and um I just value it's really humbling being an apprentice it's really humbling being in the core and trying to fight your way out um to to get promoted and um dance new roles and so that really helps with with keeping me grounded. It's a it's a it's a great level of, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think just moving on that, the reason why we push for change and talk about wanting to change ballet is because we do love it so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if you were to ask my friends, they'd say I'm a diva. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could have my diva tendencies, but. Uh, I, everyone loves a good diva. I mean, but it only comes on so maybe Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday is diva days. Tuesday, Thursday yeah. is like normal days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, a healthy balance of diva is, I think, is important <laughs> um, to to essential living. But no, I, I would be mortified. I would be absolutely mortified if someone ever said I was rude mm. or um, condescending or. Um, I just, that would irk me to my core. Mm. Um, so, but, and so, yeah, I try to be, I just try to be, be nice. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's just, simple, but it's true. Be nice. Um, and then last question is, um, since this is the Good Valley Juju podcast, what are you doing to help yourself feel good and feel up the juju, especially during this time? <sighs> I'm... I'm 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 listening to what makes me happy mm. and and brings me joy, and um, not being unap- not apologizing for the things, or maybe the lack thereof things. You know, I think I see a lot of dancers who are so active, and I'm like, should I do that? But you know, f- don't force yourself to do something that you don't want, and listen to your body. And um, but I will also say and maybe this is contradicting, but just keep creating and keep making things and keep thinking and keep um, having new ideas and um, allow yourself to have moments of pause and breath. But um, it's we're in a time where it's so important to, to own your thoughts, whatever they are. Mm. Um, not necessarily share them, but the... It's true when they say that art heals and yeah. the, the create the creative element that you know um, dance has, I think is just really, really powerful. So I'm trying to uh, keep creating and keep thinking and keep having something to say. I mean, I my poor neighbors have been seeing me run around the backyard in still. <laughs> And I mean, I, I went down the other day and set the camera in the middle of the street and did soda shots back and forth for one campaign. And I also, you know, I have this sunroom in the back and I mm. put a chair down, a, then a mirror up, draped a sheet over it, taped it to the walls and put up a self-timer camera and did a full photo shoot for a cam- the candles. And you'll see it soon. And... I was like, it, it took me like two hours, but my mind went somewhere and mm. I, I went on a journey and I, I, I value that. And I think mm. that's really important. So um, just keep creating, keep, keep creating. I think that's a, 
that's good advice. And I think that's definitely important to do, especially, you know, when you're feeling in a rut. Yeah. During this time, when the days kind of run into each other, it's good to find things that challenge yourself even while you're trying to take care of yourself. I think it's a yeah. balance. Um, well, Harper, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, we haven't got a chance to meet in person, but I hope one day that will happen soon. If, I, when the I is over, <laughs> you I teach me how to walk in pink you. I can't. <laughs> I can't. I don't know if I can even <laughs> anymore right now, but thank you for having me and thank you for all that you do. You've been such a support to, to you know, the dancers of Houston Ballet and dancers everywhere and your kindness, it speaks volumes and it, we, we're we so appreciative of um, of your voice and what you have to say and what you share and uh, you're making a difference as well. I would exactly say the exact same thing to you, my friend. So let's keep doing what we're doing and sending each other cute. Maybe if you're ever feeling down, let me know. I'll send you a cute puppy in the DMs. That's oh, cool. I love that. The puppy support system. <laughs> puppy support system. Mine's asleep right now. I don't want to wake her up, but... <laughs>